the Pali Canon, they'd like to point out again and again how even the life of a king is not very enviable. Even the king who is wisest, Bembisara, is not about being teased by his queens. There was one time he was suffering from hemorrhoids. And the queens teased him that he was having his first period, and soon he's going to give birth. He was very embarrassed about this, and he sent for the Buddhist doctor to help cure the hemorrhoids. Other kings are portrayed as being a lot more dense. Bimbisara, after all, was a stream enterer. Papasanity, Gauravya, they come across as a little dense because they've been fooled by the appearances of the world. You see this in the four Dharma summaries. Ratabala, who is the son of a, of a wealthy family, went forth, became an arahant, came back to visit the family. The family just did not give him the proper welcome at all, so he went off to meditate in the, the king's pleasure garden. The king found out about this and wanted to talk to him because he was curious. He was a son from a fine family, he hadn't suffered any loss of relatives, loss of health, loss of wealth, and yet he ordained. The king couldn't understand why anybody would want to ordain. After all, there all the pleasures of power, all the pleasures of wealth. And Sir Atabella taught him the four Dharma summaries. It took the king a while to understand them. First one, the world is swept away. See, so what does that mean? And here is the king is 80 years old, and a lot of his body has been swept away. They may have been thinking that as a king he still had his power, but that was going to be swept away too. So Ratabala asked him, when you were young, were you strong? Yes. He was very strong. Sometimes he felt like he had the strength of two people. How about now? Sometimes I mean to put my foot in one place, the king says, and it goes someplace else. Same body, but it's a different body. This particular Dharma summary is one on aging and two on the principle of inconstancy. Things are going to change. There's another passage in the canon where a monk says, aging drops on you as if out of nowhere, and your body is something else than what it was before. The second Dharma summary, the world offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. What does this mean? Of course, the king feels he's very much in charge. So Ratabala asked him, do you have a recurring illness? And the king does. A wind illness, which meant shooting pains through his body. This is when your courtiers are hanging around. What do they say? The king says, well, they're, they're basically saying, now he's going to die, now he's going to die. Imagine that, surrounded by people who can't wait for you to die. And then Ratabella asks him, can you tell the courtiers to share out the pain so that you don't have to suffer so much from it? And the king says, no, I have to bear it myself. Okay, there it is. The world has an, offers no shelter. When pain comes, it's, it's your pain. And you can't parse it out and say, well, I'll lessen today's pain. I'll, be, I'll spread it out a little bit so it's not so quite intense. It's, whatever intensity it's going to be, that's the intensity it's going to have. However long it's going to be, that's its length. This is a principle of the aging, excuse me, of illness and the principle of stress and suffering. The third, the world has nothing of its own. And again, the king says, what do you mean it has nothing of its own? I've got all these storehouses full of treasure. Ratabala asks him, can you take it with you when you go? Well, no, I have to leave it. 
So aging, illness, and now death. And then inconstancy, stress, and now not self. Sometimes people think of the teaching on rebirth as a huge self-teaching. In other words, you're not going to die. You're going to keep on going. But there's so much you've got to let go when you die. And then in spite of all of this, Roger Bell points out in the fourth summary, the world is a slave to craving. It keeps wanting to come back again and again and again. The king says, what do you mean it's a slave to craving? So Roger Bell asked him, suppose there was someone to come and say there was a kingdom off to the east, wealthy but weak. With a force of your army, you could conquer it. Would you conquer it? And the king says, yes, here he is, eighty years old. He'd go for another kingdom, not just one other kingdom. Prattava goes, goes on, a kingdom to the south, a kingdom to the west, a kingdom to the north. In each case, King Gaurabhi would say, yes, I'd go for that one too. How about one on the other side of the ocean? Go for that one too. The world is insatiable. It never has enough. Because it keeps lying to itself about what it's going to get. In all these cases, Gaurabhya is portrayed as being blind to what's actually going on, right in front of his eyes. Of course, he's typical for all of us. We get in our heads that we'd like something. We'd like power, we'd like wealth, we'd like fame, we'd like beauty. We'd like a good relationship with somebody. And then we get blinders. We can only see that one thing that we focus on, and we don't see all the drawbacks. Now a lot of the things that we go for are, are like mirages. They look real enough, but as you get there, there's nothing there. Or if there's something there, it's certainly not what you thought it was going to be. This is what the Buddha said, that craving is based on ignorance. We willfully ignore things about the world. And that's why we're hungry for them. So the cure, of course, is to learn how to step back and look at that hunger, look at that craving, and also look at the, what the world has to offer, and ask, isn't there something better? Isn't there something worth desiring? Now, some people would say, well, you just learn how to have to learn how to accept the things, just come and go and be okay with that, and then you won't be disillusioned. But still, you have to struggle, struggle, struggle to maintain even just a life. Isn't there something better than that? It was in quest of that something better that Ratabala left all his wealth and his power and his comforts. And as the story said, because he became an Arahant, he found what he was looking for. So it is possible to find something that's not swept away, something that does offer shelter. After all, shelter is one of the names the Buddha gave to nirvana. And even though there's no sense of it's being your own, once it's there, once it's attained, you don't lose it. So as is so often the case in the Buddhist teachings, we focus on the drawbacks of the world, not just to badmouth it, but to remind ourselves there must be something better. This is why we meditate. This is why we look inside, because the something better is inside. It's not in the world. As I said last night, the Buddhist instructions are don't go for the world, put aside greed and distress with reference to the world, and just look at what you've got in and of itself right here. Because these are the things from which you make the world. You've got body, you've got feelings, you've got the mind. How about making something better out of them? How about making them into a path? You can't make them into nirvana, but you can make them to, into a path to the ultimate peace.
You focus on the breath, create a feeling of well-being. Get the mind bright, alert, insightful, clear seeing. And you can do a lot. When you learn how to resist the appeal of the world. As Karavi, when you come down to it, is a pretty sad figure. He's got all these things. But because he has all these things, his courtiers can't wait for him to go so they can grab their share. He's getting so old now that the things really don't have that much more meaning. And then you look at Rantabala. Rantabala was wise enough to see, okay, this is not where happiness is found. In wealth and power. He was wise enough to leave his house, leave his home. It required a lot of sacrifice. I mean, he had to sacrifice the love and respect of his family. But he knew that if he just lived in that old life, he'd end up like the king at best. Deluded and disappointed. That was because the Buddha offered something better. It is possible through our efforts to find something inside that is more lasting value, that's not swept away, that offers shelter, and that's not going to leave us. So as you look at your body and it's aging, you run up against illness, even as you're facing death. Remember, there's a part of the mind that doesn't grow ill, doesn't age, doesn't die. And it's thirsty for something better than what it's had before. And so you tend to that. Because all too often as aging, illness, and death come, we start grasping after well, what we had before. This is why people get reborn. They just come back with the same old stuff over and over again. But the Buddha is asking you to develop this perception of how no world at all is desirable. There's a case of the, the monk, Giriyamananda, who was sick. and The Buddha told Ananda to go teach him ten different perceptions. And one of the perceptions is how no world at all is desirable. But that doesn't mean there's nothing at all desirable. There's something that's not a world. That's what you want to focus your sights on. So try to develop the qualities of mind through your body, through your feelings, putting them together with the right state of mind. And you can create a path to that something other that's not a world. That's the Buddha's message. It's interesting that these four Dharma summaries are not mentioned anywhere else in the canon, simply in Ratabala's report to the king. It makes you wonder how many other teachings of the Buddha got lost, teachings that he would give to individual monks and lay people, nuns, that they remembered but were not remembered by the community as a whole. We're lucky we have this teaching. Because it makes it very graphic the case for why it's good to be meditating, why it's good to be practicing. And whatever efforts you make in the direction of getting beyond these worlds that are swept away, is all very much worthwhile.